and we are live. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ruth Glick, and I'm gonna be moderating this panel, Why Arbitrate International Disputes, a Primer in International Arbitration. And I have a stellar panel to help me do it in alphabetical order. Let me introduce Jeffrey Darr, who is chair of the ADR Committee of the California Lawyers Association, which is the sponsor of this webinar, and also the sponsor of California International Arbitration Week, starting March 14th through March 18th. Jeff is a principal of Dara Newman, where he concentrates on both litigation and transactional projects for clients, and where he focuses on cross-border litigation and transactions and class actions and insurance issues uh, and other uh, interesting uh, disputes. He has been appointed by three different Los Angeles mayors uh, for different boards and commissioner posts and currently serves as the Los Angeles ethics commissioner. Next is Marcus Quintanilla, a partner at Jones Day with offices in San Francisco and Mexico City. He focuses his practice on international arbitration and cross-border litigation. And he combines seasoned counseling and targeted cost-effective advocacy for clients in energy, electronics, mining, infrastructure, and consumer brands. Marcus partners with in-house counsel and business teams to advance client interests in commercial disputes worth billions of dollars. And Quen Ta, who is a partner of King and & Spaulding, and she was named one of the top 100 lawyers in California and one of the top 500 lawyers in America. She's a very successful litigator. She focuses on high stakes global business disputes for some very well-known uh, large public companies and for some private venture back companies. And you may have heard her name recently here in San Francisco because she was in the news as the lead attorney representing an elderly Asian American man, this victim of a hate crime. And I'm Ruth Glick. I am a international and domestic arbitrator and mediator associated with the American Arbitration Association and the ICDR, CPR, and other panels. And um, I am here to moderate the program. And uh, we, we have a, really a lot of information to get in the next hour. So hang in there. I hope you'll learn a lot. And I hope after this, you will be very anxious to attend the International Arbitration Week. So we are going to be discussing the role of international arbitration in California. What do client interests favor arbitration? When do they favor arbitration? And a preview of the California International Arbitration Week. So the role of international arbitration in California. Quinn, tell us what is international arbitration and how is it affecting us here in California? Uh, and, and thank you, Ruth, um, for um, your kind introduction and obviously very um, honored to be on this panel with Marcus and Jeff and with you. Um, I think before I get um, real quickly to the California Act, I mean, I think for many of us, um, international arbitration is very relevant. Um, many of us have clients in Asia. California has become a, a nice hub for Pacific Rim clients. And I think, you know, these slides are just very basic for those who um, haven't um, done international arbitration, but, you know, it's, it's in our, you know, code of civil procedure. And here we say the California Arbitration and Conciliation of International Commercial Disputes Act, it's codified at 1297.11. And basically it applies to international commercial arbitration, right, and conciliation subject to any agreement which is enforced between the United States and any other states or states. So we just put this here to let you know, it's there in the code for those who weren't aware, um, based substantially on um, the UNCITRAL um, rules. And, um, you know, California is the first of the US states to adopt this and, and still only eight have done so. Um, next slide. 
um, here we just set forth, um, you know, the section 1297.13, and it provides uh, when an arbitration or conciliation agreement is international. I won't read every single uh, provision to you, but um, this is here so that those know, those who know, and particularly if you are helping your clients think through a good venue for international arbitration, California is certainly one, and you just need to make sure that you comply with these conditions. Next slide, Ruth. And how do you trigger it? It basically is triggered if parties agree to arbitrate in accordance with California law and the act will apply to the exclusion of the domestic arbitration law, which there is also, as many of you know, for those of us who do class actions and others. Um, one thing we wanted to make clear that um, just the in terms of the California International Arbitration Act, it applies in most part in the base in our experience in conjunction with um, and not inconsistent with the FAA. And so the next slide, Ruth. I think many of you already know this, but um, for a very long period, California was not a favored venue for um, international arbitrations in part because it was a lot more expensive. You had to go hire someone in California as well. And basically in 2018, um, SB 766 was approved and passed and many folks who are involved, um, it's including some on this panel were involved with that um, in terms of adding this to the civil code. Um, and basically SB 766 um, permits out of state and foreign attorneys to appear in California based international arbitration for the limited purpose of representing a party, meaning you don't have to hire a local counsel, which makes it a lot more um, cost effective and practical. And so Ruth, back to you on this one. Okay, I, I hope I didn't cut you off, Quinn. No, no you but didn't. international arbitration is now widely accepted why? Uh, because it's an alternative to litigation before uh, national uh, domestic courts of different countries, where some of the countries may be following common law like we do in the United States, or some might be following civil law like they do in Germany and France. So um, international arbitration is perceived as the best forum for international disputes and is now considered to be the conventional method of such disputes. Uh, there's been significant growth because of the growth in international trade and investment. Uh, companies like our companies based in the U.S. and companies based abroad and now have since substantial uh, international presence in, in other countries, and particularly here in California, Asia-based countries and Asia-based transactions are certainly on the rise. Uh, technology disputes are on the rise and all kinds of issues having to do with intellectual property, patent infringement, trademarks, distributorship, licensing issues, and so forth. So um, the disputes are on a rise. Uh, the international arbitration is favored because uh, there are very certain key international conventions that support international arbitration. They're available to ensure the enforcement of the awards. And because of that, the enforcement of an international arbitration award is more predictable than the enforcement of uh, litigated judgments, um, primarily because these treaties and conventions uh, facilitate that enforcement. And we compare that to the absence of comparable international legal support for litigation. Uh, these uh, conventions uh, apply primarily to arbitration and just to note that not only arbitration, but now mediation, recently the Singapore uh, Convention for Mediation um, got off the ground, I think in 2018, and now has 55 signatories to enforce mediated settlements. Uh, but Marcus, why don't you tell us why your clients favor arbitration? Yeah, thank you very much, Ruth. And thank you for the kind introduction. Delighted to, to be here with everybody. Uh, and provide this little primer and hopefully uh, get you hooked on uh, coming to International Arbitration Week. Um, I'm gonna say some things here that are it, really in the nature of signposting for the rest of our presentation. And it echoes some of the things that Ruth has just said, but you know, this graphic uh, really kind of moves in concentric circles. And the first, the outer circle there really responds to the question, uh, what kinds of disputes do we as California lawyers frequently see 
that might actually wind up in international arbitration. Uh, and I've listed just a few on the outer uh, circumference there uh, that represent my experience and that of many other colleagues. One big area is in the mergers and acquisitions context, where you may have um, earnout provisions, and you certainly have reps and warranties from the uh, acquired company to the acquirer. Uh, and very frequently, these kinds of transactions cross borders, and unfortunately, very frequently, they, re they result in disputes about, did you really do what you were supposed to do? Uh, we, we seem to be advancing a little bit. Let's go back. Okay. So uh, those kinds of disputes frequently arise in the international context. Licensing is huge here in California. Both IP licensing of, of a high-tech nature, could be patents, it could be actual technology, or it could be trademarks. Uh, all because of the, the power of our consumer brands here. Uh, and finally, we know that there's all kinds of distribution arrangements. And in the age of COVID, uh, supply chains have become a household word. Uh, we know that there's a lot of business interruptions. They cross borders. And so they could present you and your clients with disputes subject to arbitration. But when does arbitration actually benefit your clients. So for example, if you're in the business of advising whether to agree to a contract that has an arbitration clause, when would it be good? When would it be bad? We're really going to be touching on uh, the various items that you see in the colored uh, layer of this wheel. Uh, we'll be starting with a discussion of enforceable judgments. That's the item over there at kind of 10 o'clock uh, on our uh, circular graph. But as we're going to see, if you're in a position where you think your client is going to be the claimant on a substantial money claim, and they have to go after assets that are not in the United States, arbitration could be a really good choice. Next, the question of who actually is going to be your fact finder uh, and your adjudicator. There are, we all know there are some cases where you want a common sense fairness approach by a lay jury. And there are situations where you want someone with real technical expertise and legal sophistication. If you're in the latter bucket, think about arbitration. Confidentiality, discovery, and costs, these three all go together. If you're especially concerned about confidentiality, if you want to keep discovery on the lighter side compared to U.S. litigation, and maybe want to keep costs down, for those three reasons, arbitration could be valuable. And lastly, I'll point to speed and finality and preliminary injunctive relief. We'll be talking about those at the end of the presentation. Suffice it to say, arbitration can be faster and it's certainly more final. Question whether that's what you want or not. Uh, and preliminary injunctive relief raises special issues. The need for speed in an attachment or a TRO presents questions in arbitration that we'll be discussing later in the presentation. Back to you, Ruth. Okay, and I'm gonna to turn to Jeff, client interest. What is the client interest in enforceable awards? Sure. And thank you. Let me give some context to what I'm gonna be discussing, which is I believe personally is one of the, probably the most compelling reason to consider international arbitration over litigation when you're dealing with a cross-border transaction. So let's assume for a moment that you're putting together a cross-border transaction of two or more different countries with your clients or the participants may be to the agreement. There's gonna be a written agreement, most likely than not. Uh, you're gonna have issues of venue. Where is the a dispute heard if there is one? Uh, you're gonna have issues of, will there be jurisdiction over the parties where you agree to have venue or where you should have venue? My experience is, is that if you want to have an agreement that works, one of the most important parts of the agreement is making certain that the dispute resolution provisions actually will work so that parties will be held accountable if they breach and don't perform. But that's assuming, of course, that that's the interest of the parties. Typically it is. So in a simple transaction where someone is to simply, you know, provide goods, pay money or uh, license, uh, rights or technology and uh, pay a royalty, 
what do you do if someone thinks they don't have to perform because they won't be held accountable? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about very briefly here. So with that context, uh, let me explain, particularly for those people who may not be fans of domestic arbitration in the United States. They may not be fans because they think it doesn't have an appeal process or it could be subject to uh, being arbitrary. Let's take a look at how litigation works in that cross-border transaction versus international arbitration as a dispute resolution tool. So default will be, if you don't have by agreement anything, litigation in a court someplace. And your agreement hopefully will address that and provide the venue. But what happens when, because you have two or more countries involved, that the assets of the person who's gonna be you know, failing to perform who you wanna get a judgment against is in another place, it doesn't have the assets, for example, if we're in the United States, in the United States. And even if you're able to negotiate where the venue for litigation is in the United States versus another country, what happens when you get that judgment at the end of the day? And will the other party believe they'll be held accountable even if you get a judgment? So very quickly, first, there is no international treaty, and there's none that realistically is in the works in our near future, that would provide for any recognition and enforceability agreements between different countries for a US judgment. That means that if you have litigation here to get your judgment, you have to sit here and this is what I usually do. If I know that I'm gonna to have to then enforce it in another part of the world, I'll get a lawyer involved typically to help me make sure that everything I'm doing here will likely be recognized and enforced in that other part of the world. But even that is not so simple. I've had lots of experience in this ways. And even when you do everything you think you're doing and you're dealing with uh, you know, major Western countries, not countries where there may be very different perspectives on how independent the courts may be, the rule of law may be, even then courts will often in foreign countries you know, favor local companies, look for excuses not to recognize and enforce. If it's a jury uh, verdict, they may not be as friendly to it. If there's punitive damages, even if it's permitted by agreement, they may not recognize them. And you can go down a path of lots of the complications of having litigation play out in a meaningful way, particularly with getting satisfaction for your judgment by actually getting the assets of the other side when they fail to perform. Of course, if the party who is supposed to perform knows they'll be held accountable, how much more likely they'll perform? A lot. So in the United States, there is no federal law on enforcement and recognition of international uh, foreign money judgments. It's done by state law. Uh, the good news is there is a model act that most of the states have adopted, however, with variations on the model law. So they're not all uniform. Uh, in fact, there are not California, but five states, I believe still, that require officially reciprocity, meaning that they won't recognize a foreign country's judgment if you're the one trying to now enforce the judgment in the United States, unless the foreign country also recognizes US judgments. So you get into lots of those types of issues, lots of unpredictability. And again, a recipe for people who may at some point not want to perform as everyone intends not to perform. So on the other hand, uh, if we look at international arbitration, it's surprisingly completely different and historically very different. We could go to the next slide. Okay. So this is just a slide to emphasize how alone the United States may be because we have no treaties with the rest of the world on the recognition and enforcement of our money judgments. And if we could then go to the next slide. Uh, this slide is an excellent depiction of, and I'll get into the nitty gritty on it in a second, how different things are if you have a international arbitration as your dispute resolution provision in a commercial international transaction. And the red countries are all the countries that are parties to an international treaty that's been around since approximately 1955 called the New York Convention, where there is an agreed upon by treaty by virtually everybody in the world for the recognition and enforceability of an international arbitration award, the akin equivalent of a judgment in litigation. That is why international arbitration is why we're 
having this program today while we're having a whole week dedicated to California international arbitration because California international arbitration, I'll explain in a moment, makes so much more sense if you want to have predictability for your clients and have that expectation that people will be held accountable if they ever decide it's not in their interest to perform anymore. We go to the next slide. So when you deal with an international arbitration award, uh, other than the fact it's not recognized per se, but under the treaty, and we'll get into this a little bit more in a moment, uh, other than getting recognition of the first state, there's this New York convention, which has 169 member states. 169. What that means is of the United Nations, 193 nations, 166 of them are parties to this long standing since 1950s international treaty. Talk about predictability compared to judgments where there's zero predictability. Drastically different. That's why international arbitration in an international commercial transaction is the subject of this program and our week. Uh, I will note that the last country to ratify the New York Convention to become a member was Iraq, and that was just last year. Uh, the only modern world country that you would think of that any of us would likely do business with for our directly as a business person or their clients would be Taiwan. But Taiwan is technically not allowed to uh, be a member. Having said that, Taiwan typically will recognize as if the treaty was in effect international arbitration awards. The only countries that are not members are countries that you're extremely unlikely to ever have business with, at least in the United States. And as an example, they're very small countries such as Chad, Republic of Congo, Libya, Yemen, North Korea. The rest of the world is all part of this treaty. And the only other note on here is US friendship treaties. And it's just a reminder that when you're looking at recognition enforcement of judgments in particular, there are a number of generally forgotten, but they are in good standing friendship treaties. A lot of them came out of World War II between the United States and other countries. And sometimes they'll have provisions for not recognition of judgments, but language that's friendly, if you need even more, on international arbitration awards. And then again, this goes back a long time, these friendship treaties, and sometimes for uh, reciprocity for judicial assistance, which you, you can read into being helpful on judgments. So are we ready to move on, Jeff? I don't want to cut you off. Oh, My, you are ready to move on. The PowerPoint just moves forward by itself. Right. So. <laughs> We've got this thing set to automatic, so it keeps yeah. us on track. Marcus, um, so we got to know if uh, enforcement can ever be refused. Right. So um, everything that Jeff just said was true uh, and very uh, important, I think, for evaluating client interests. At the same time, it is important to know that there are some circumstances under which recognition of an international arbitration award can be denied. I'm going to go through these quickly, but the key thing that we're going to observe is a country who's a, an adherent to the New York Convention is not entitled to re-examine the merits of the decision that the arbitrators made and substitute their judgment for the facts or the law. The grounds for uh, not enforcing an international arbitration award are much more limited. So number one, where the award itself is the subject of the rev of review in the state of origin, okay? So in other words, the award itself isn't exactly final because it's being challenged in the court of the seat of arbitration. Right. Number two, if the time limit for seeking ordinary review has not expired. So in other words, number one, is it being challenged? Number two, might it be challenged? That's a reason that a court in any country that uh, has signed the convention could decide, no, no, we're not going to enforce that arbitration award yet. Uh, number three, where the party's contract itself was null and void under the law, of the state uh, of the arbitration, unless they have had a finding that the arbitration agreement itself was valid, even if the contract more broadly was not. And that's gonna relate to the issue, we're not gonna get into it in any depth on this discussion, but 
the separability principle, the idea that an arbitration clause can be valid even if the contract it's contained within is not. So the whole dispute about validity will be in the arbitration, will be resolved in the arbitration. Ground number four, where a party lacks capacity to conclude the agreement in the first place under the law of the place where you're trying to get enforcement. Let's move on to the next slide. And next, essentially this is probably the one that you're gonna see most commonly in practice. It's a due process issue. Where, I won't go through reading all of this verbiage, but in essence, if you have a problem with notice and opportunity to be heard, if someone can claim validly that they didn't get proper notice of the arbitration, that's a ground for an enforcement court to deny enforcement. Next slide. No, I think we went backwards. Uh, that's the genie in the slideshow here. <laughs> there we go. All right. Further on this notion of uh, due process, you can challenge an award at the place where it's being enforced if you can show that it was procured by fraud in some way or corruption. Number seven, where recognition or enforcement would be manifestly incompatible with the public policy of the requested state. In other words, the state where you're trying to enforce the award, right? Or whether the award would be incompatible with fundamental principles of procedural fairness or due process. Next slide. And lastly here, these two are also kind of related. Number eight, where the award is inconsistent with a judgment given in the requested uh, state, hold on, I got a little off track, I'm sorry, but in essence, it's where the award is inconsistent with a judgment that it, of the country where you're trying to enforce it, or inconsistent with a judgment or early award, earlier award in another country that is entitled to race judicata effect in the United States, even if that's only under uh, a principle of comedy. So in essence, numbers eight and nine are about race judicata. And if you come with an award and you try to enforce an award that is already blocked by a pre-existing judgment or award, that is again, a basis not to recognize the award. Now I saw in the questions that popped up, you know, a question arose, does the place of arbitration uh, affect how enforceable the award is. And uh, I think it's valid to, to indicate just a few things on this. The answer is yes, in particular, if the place of arbitration is not a signatory to the New York Convention, you could have greater difficulties. But as Jeff said, there are pretty few of those. Taiwan is the main uh, one you would have to have some concern about. But the second issue is, if your place of arbitration is a place that, where the courts are less favorable to arbitration and therefore more willing to entertain challenges to the award at the place where the award is given, that can have ripple effects and make it harder to enforce that award uh, in other jurisdictions. So that's part of what you need to keep in mind in thinking about where to agree to have the seat of arbitration. Think at that point. Okay, I back to you, Ruth. Okay, thanks, Marcus. Um, we're going to talk about the client interests. And uh, Quinn, tell us what needs does international arbitration serve for your clients? Sure. Thank you for that, Ruth. Um, so I think you can go. Let's see, expert fact finders. Um, can you go to the next slide? Um, many of us who do both domestic and international arbitration um, know that in the international context, many of our disputes are highly technical. So for instance, in the infrastructure context, construction, many of us have four, five, six experts. Those types of disputes, I think, are um, better suited for a panel of complex um, arbitrators who themselves, many have, have um, litigated these cases as well. Um, 
I, I, on these slides, though, I do want to turn to Jeff and Marcus uh, to seek their feedback, too, because in terms of the client interest, I think we're seeing the same thing. Many of our cases are requiring more and more experts, and um, I think these cases go much more quickly. I can tell you that in a case like for arbitration, international arbitration, we can get through four weeks of um, heavy expert testimony, whereas if you had a jury trial, for instance, um, it could take much, much longer um, in, in the domestic context. I see Marcus is nodding your head. So Marcus, do you want to chime in as well? Sure. I, I mean, I, I agree with that, uh, Quinn. And in general, I think there's certainly a place for a common sense jury, and there's a place for arbitrators that have a little more technical uh, or legal sophistication. And, um, you know, I can, I can, one case that I just remember is when, you know, when you're talking about engineering concepts that are extremely complex, in a case I did, there was welding. This was the worst looking welding on earth, okay? And it was done by my client. Uh, and if that had been just in front of a jury, you just show these terrible welds and it's very hard to control that. On the other hand, what, what really the facts showed was that it was a very complex engineering problem. The welds didn't need to hold any they weren't supporting in any way. They could have been Gorilla Glue. They would have worked fine. So they weren't really the cause of the failure, but it would have been very difficult to convey that message without fact finders who were able to roll up their sleeves and really process complicated engineering studies. Uh, thank you, Marcus. And, I, and Jeff probably agrees as well. Jeff, you want to say something? Yeah, let me, let me just add the comment that uh, one of you know the major advantages of international arbitration when it comes to a international commercial transaction is you can customize it. You you know do you want to be at the whims of a you know national court wherever it may be by your agreement to a judge that you have no control in picking versus having the ability for the parties to pick arbitrators that actually fit the type of case. And typically, in, when you're dealing with an international commercial transaction, there's going to be a whole added dimension of issues due to the fact that it's international. You know, maybe different legal systems. It may be uh, the choice of law not being U.S. law, which you can do in a U.S. court, but you're more likely to have the ability to control who your arbitrators are and maybe get people who are familiar, as you know, Marcus was mentioning, with the specific type of issues that may come up factually versus completely not. And for those who have tried jury trials on very complicated cases with you know, foreign law and uh, you know, very uh, not intuitive uh, business agreements, uh, that's a challenge and there's nothing wrong with that, but why not control the process better, particularly when you get back to the issue of what's gonna be easier to have predictability of being recognized and forced at the end of the day. That's a really good point. Many of us who do international arbitrations, there's a panel of at least three arbitrators. And so at least for your wing person, you're probably gonna pick someone who has the expertise um, that Jeff is talking about, right? Whether through their own you know, substantive background, educational background, at least you have that wing arbitrator who you know you and your client were able to pick. The other side will obviously pick, you know, you know, some of their own characteristics of the arbitrator, the expert fact finder as well. But I agree with you. There's there's some helpfulness in being able to control who is your expert fact finder. On confidentiality, that's another um, issue that um, for some clients are very important. So, you know, I have a case right now that the client doesn't want, for whatever reasons, to be out in the news. You know, I think um, many of us know when we do domestic trials and um, cases here in the United States, it's public record, right? And so um, confidentiality, confidentiality of arbitrations um, is particularly uh, something that is is important. Um, Ruth, can you go to the next slide and then I'll ask Marcus and Jeff if they have comments. But yes, it's not perfect, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. All right. 23. Um, the, the, you know, if you have to enforce an award, that often becomes public, right? Your award does, all the issues do. Um, but I do think that for many clients who don't want their issues to be aired in the public and to have public pleadings out there and news reported on that, confidentiality is, is something that is, is very much valued. Marcus and Jeff, um, your experiences as well? Oh, totally agree with you, uh, Quinn. And of course, as you say, there, there's the Iron Man with his mask uh, cracked open. It is not perfect. 
uh, for the reasons that you say. And, and also, look, if your client is a public company and it's a substantial dispute, they probably have to uh, report those things in their securities filings. But still, it's a matter of degree. Uh, and I'd rather be this guy in the, uh, the suit of shining armor than the Roman with his kneecaps exposed. <laughs> exactly. Marcus, uh, Jeff, anything else? Sure. Um, you know, and again, what we haven't really, this, isn't, this program is more basic, but what we haven't really talked about is that one of the beauties of international arbitration is it's by agreement and you can customize as much as you want. So, for example, if your commercial transaction deals with technology, and trade secrets, rather than having it come up later on when there's a dispute in whatever court it may be, you can control the process early on, put in the provisions you want by agreement before you even have a dispute as to how trade secrets may be handled, how technology may be handled. You can pick where the arbitration will be administered. You can pick you know, the how that's done. You can customize it. You can look at the roles you're agreeing to beforehand and you can change them. If you're in a court, you know, maybe we know as California lawyers, which is our audience today, what the roles are likely to be. And even then, a court may or may not agree with the party's concept of a protective order. They may have something else in mind. I've had that happen a lot of times recently with federal judges and magistrates. But you can sit here and avoid the uncertainty of those things. And just if you know you're going to have those type of issues, plan ahead and do it from the very beginning in a way that's protective and works for everybody. And that way you minimize the you know, problems of having you know, ultimately the trade secret being out of the bag or you know, by accident uh, controlling the dispute. You can manage it all and keep your secrets exactly as intended, protected. The other thing I would note too is both California state courts and federal courts are becoming more and more stringent with regard to motions to seal. And so, I mean, you know, even if you think that it's something that is, you know, very much um, should be sealed, many courts will disagree with you. And then you have to go back to the drawing board. I've had situations where, you know, it's in state court, in California state court, for instance, litigation, high stakes. And then we have to even proffer uh, a witness to go in or put in a declaration as to why these materials should be sealed, right? And so uh -huh. the, the cost related to confidentiality is quite high even if you do state court, because there are ways to do it for trade secrets cases, IP cases, or other business related sensitive materials. So it's just something that comes to mind when you both are talking and for clients, confidentiality, if it is high for you, it's high stakes. Yes, the, the company may have to disclose it anyway in the securities filings, but it's different than opening up your newspaper and seeing it because most consumers aren't reading the SEC filings. Um, next client. If I could just add just one quick thing, which is, you know, remember, uh, you may be having, as your client, the foreign party to the international commercial transaction, and in the other countries, the concept of things being as open they are in courts is just an alien concept, let alone that a judge is not going to necessarily allow the parties to protect and keep confidential all of their, what they think are confidential agreements and documents among themselves. And that's something to deal with when your client's the one who you know, doesn't even anticipate that there's an issue going to be occurring in the United States. Thanks so much, Jeff. The slides are just advancing automatically, right, Ruth, so that we can keep on time. <laughs> um, client interest, the other issue is limited discovery. Those of us who do domestic litigation know that discovery is can just be so expansive and expensive, right? And the level of discovery in, uh, you know, for instance, under California law, it's just what is relevant. And many of us know if you're fighting a motion to compel, most likely you're going to lose if the other side can show some level of relevancy. Um, the next slide, Ruth. Not moving by itself. <laughs> okay. In contrast, um, for instance, under the ICC rules, let's say you're doing discovery, it's quite limited. Um, you know, it's it's confined typically under the procedural order. You know, to a very short period of time, and you have to show, you have to describe it in detail and in a very narrow way why you need these these documents or this discovery and also um, materiality. You have to show that these documents are material to the outcome, right? And so typically arbitrators, you know, they have a viewpoint coming in to these international arbitrations that you're not going to get as much as civil litigation. And you're not typically, unless you agree to it, you're not going to get depositions. And so for those who know what the dispute is, they know what the issues are, you want to move it forward, 
um, you know, limited discovery can be a positive aspect of international arbitrations for many of our clients. Marcus and, and Jeff, anything to add to that? Just again, you can customize in your international arbitration dispute resolution revisions the type of discovery you may want. And sometimes you may want a little more than minimum. You know, for example, if your side, if there was a dispute, would need to prove damages with evidence from the other side, you don't want to unintentionally limit yourself. So you need to look at the roles you're agreeing to of whatever tribunal is going to administer and customize them. That's the real beauty for international uh, disputes because you get to constrain that dimension of other new issues that you're not used to by agreement ahead of time and just be smart and not use boilerplate uh, agreements. Look at the actual circumstances of your international commercial transaction and make your dispute resolution fit the needs of what at least your side would want. Agreed. Okay, moving on. Discovery, I'm going to take this from the point of view of the arbitrator, because as an arbitrator, I will consult the arbitration agreement first for my scope of authority, for the governing rules, or any limitations that the tribunal uh, may have. Um, as uh, I described earlier, there are different expectations between common law and civil law countries. And as a result, um, parties uh, in international arbitration, at least the tribunal, generally is guided by the IBA taking on rules on taking of evidence. And that's particularly useful when the parties come from different legal cultures. Uh, the IBA rules offers tools for a limited search of evidence um, that importantly is relevant and material to the outcome and uh, balanced by cost. There is, this is sort of similar to American style, but there's a growing trend towards the American style, they call the Americanization of discovery because um, internationally they think it might be too broad, but there is a growing trend toward it. And, um, um, and, and so that is what we're seeing today. Um, under uh, 28 USC 1782, uh, that governs much of international litigation and which permits uh, litigants to invoke the, th the authority of the US courts to assist in the gathering of evidence in international disputes. But there's a split among the circuits about whether uh, this is permitted in arbitration uh, some circuits would permit it, others would exclude it. And that is uh, the subject matter of this case before the US Supreme Court, ZF Automotive US versus Luxshare. Uh, I think oral arguments have been heard or will shortly be heard. Um, and uh, whether or not, you know, uh, uh, 1782 will be available in private commercial arbitration. Um, from the point of view of the arbitrator, uh, if they do grant that, I think, uh, that I hope that the uh, Supreme Court uh, continues to allow a great deal of effort, uh, deference to the tribunal uh, in line with fundamental principles of international commercial arbitration that the tribunal has primary authority and control in managing uh, the proceedings and in, in managing all discovery matters. So um, that's it for uh, <laughs> keeping a strong tribunal. Um, as as uh, Jeff mentioned, we also encourage uh, parties to um, uh, expand or restrict uh, uh, discovery, uh, whatever they stipulate to, normally we would agree to unless there's some reason not to. So moving on, uh, I'm going to ask Marcus about yeah. the costs of litigation. Talk Talk real quickly about costs. And this uh, slide was the outcome of much debate uh, among the uh, members of this group um, because we, we realized that arbitration is not always cheaper. And in some experiences, uh, it can even be more expensive. Okay. So the big takeaway here is arbitration can be cheaper. I personally think it usually is uh, when compared really apples to apples with a comparable US federal lawsuit. And you know, if you're deal if you have a dispute with a US party and an international party, it's a good chance it's going to fall within alienage jurisdiction. It's going to be in federal court uh, in any case. So 
take a look at these two graphs. The, I prepared these uh, a few years ago, and I guess there's been inflation, so these numbers uh, may not be exactly on point anymore, uh, but they represent orders of magnitude. You know, and if we look over on the left-hand side, this represents uh, an IP, like a patent litigation in, in the amount of say 10 to $25 million. Uh, and the cost of litigation up through trial. And I actually think that's a pretty efficiently uh, run case, but the, the different bands give you a, a general sense of the amount that you're spending on different phases. Discovery, very big in the US litigation. Uh, motion practice, also pretty substantial. Trial, quite substantial. Wh why is trial so big there? Well, it has to do with the way our jury system works, the, the delays that are inherent in juries, uh, the fact that your trial could get kicked multiple times after you've already prepared for game day. We've all had that happen. And, and then, of course, in the U.S., litigation setting, there's always the possibility of appeal, and who knows what that's going to do. Um, so let's compare that to what we have on the right side with arbitration. You know, there is an element, the little orange line at the bottom, you have to pay arbitrators and arbitral institutions. And so that's an additional element of expense that doesn't exist on uh, the side of U.S. litigation. But discovery is relatively thin. Now, you know, maybe the disparity between the, the litigation discovery and the arbitration discoveries, maybe that's a little overblown, but still, it's a much less expensive piece. Briefing is very substantial. And why is that? It's because in arbitration, you typically put in all of your evidence, your direct testimony of all of your witnesses, both fact witnesses and experts, through rather robust written submissions. OK, uh, and but what that means is when you get to the hearing, hearing goes straight to cross-examination and it's a much more streamlined process. And it's a process with, in my experience, much more scheduling predictability. Once there's a procedural timetable for the arbitration and the arbitration arbitrators have told you when you're showing up to give your uh, to, to participate in your hearing, that's going to happen. So net net, in my experience, it is a bit cheaper, uh, and that too can be a benefit for parties. Uh, Jeff, do you have and Quinn, do you have other experiences you want to debunk my theory? So uh, we see a question here that talks about patent litigation versus licensing. I, I hear the point there because I used to do patent litigation, which can be very expensive versus licensing. But even putting aside um, sort of commercial. Um, sort of, you know, issues that come up in litigation versus arbitration, I think it can be, it can be a wash, it can be cheaper, it really depends on the case. Um, I think if you're thinking back to the interests that we talked about with um, sort of commercial issues, and, uh, you know, sort of confidentiality, I think there should be other uh, overarching interests before you pick arbitration, not just cost, because it really depends. My view is in, in doing arbitration, many arbitrators don't want you to do dispositive motions that can be helpful or hurtful. Many arbitrators will say that's one way for me to get my my uh, to get a you know to get to for the other side to achieve vacater, for instance, right? So they will put everything into the case. However, Agreed. discovery is more limited, right? So I would say on the cost point. Uh, in my view, it really depends on the type of case. Think hard about it. There should be other interests besides costs if you're advising this to your clients. But I don't know, Jeff and Marcus, you may think differently than that. I, I agree with you, actually. Okay, and Jeff, speed and finality. I'm so sort of tie into, I don't disagree with what we just were hearing. Um, so in an international arbitration, you know, again, you can control to some extent in your dispute resolution provision in the first place, the extent of the timing, how long, the cost of a likely dispute international arbitration. And so that's one of the beauties because the parties can have the ability to shape and fashion, including afterwards. You know, it's a little harder to do that with a, a litigation where a court has to agree with what the parties want. Typically the court wants to do it the court's way. Here the parties really can do it their way and the arbitrators usually are happy to go along if the parties agree. So that's 
why it's typical to be faster and more final, more final because there's no appeal and much higher level of expectation due to the New York Convention, the international treaty we talked about with 169 countries as a part of it, that your award at the end of the day, you can predict the likelihood of it being enforced and recognized wherever assets may be around the world. Unlike that court judgment where maybe, maybe not, you can predict what will happen and maybe or may not take a long time putting aside any court appeals. So if we could go to the next slide, on the other hand, with court litigation, which the people on this webinar probably are much more familiar with, you know, you're not going to have a contract that's going to really tell how the process will work. It's going to be the court rules and process that the parties may be able to pick, assuming the court agrees with their venue and choice of law and so forth. Uh, you may have disputes over jurisdiction because it's not by contract is clear. Uh, and those things could take a long time sometimes to get resolved. I've had uh, disputes over in courts, in state courts in California, arbitration where there's some discovery, uh, I'm sorry, on jurisdiction where there's some discovery on whether or not there's jurisdictional facts. And it could take without appeals another half a year to a year just to get to the point of determining jurisdiction, let alone if there's any appeals. And of course, US style discovery, the no stone unturned, drastically is what increases the cost of court litigation compared to international arbitration, as we heard. And I will also share that when we're talking about doing international business and you're dealing with people from other countries in the United States, a lot of the world is hesitant to do business in the United States because of that perspective, and correctly so, of if you're involved with this in the United States and it's in court, no stone unturned discovery, things that would be unheard of in our home country will now be done, invasive, time consuming, and may even actually hinder people wanting to do business in the United States for that reason. So by agreeing to international arbitration, you get that speed penalty and more likely than not control of costs being better and managed. But again, I, I have had experience like everyone else where arbitration for a lot of different reasons just ends up going much more involved with number of hearings and time than one would anticipate, but that's more the minority. And Jeff, just to add to that, since I do a lot of California state court litigation as well, I mean, the time for appeal these days, if you're going to the DCA, it's anywhere from 17 months to 28 months just for the appeal from your notice to when you get resolution. So just think about that for just a second. And I would say in the arbitration context, even in the motion for vacater, it's six months to a year in my view, in federal court, which is moves along much more quickly. So just, you know, just let that sit. If you appeal, if, if you do stuff in state court, 17 to 28 months alone to get your resolution. That's a lot. That's based on like 2017, 18 statistics. And it's probably slower now because of COVID. And we're not really talking that much about things like Baxter, where you're trying to essentially go to a, in the U.S., a district court judge first or court of appeals to try to uh, you know, change the arbitration award, but it's really difficult to do. The arbitrator is given much more uh, ability to fashion award as long as they appear to go through what they're supposed to do by contract. Agreed. If it's wrong, unlike in a state court, it may not matter. And that's the arbitrary part, but it does get you to that finality. And again, if the parties are expected to perform because they know how something will play out, International arbitration makes that much more predictable for parties, especially people coming from you know, different world perspectives, different countries, different languages, different cultures, uh, different judicial systems, common law versus civil law, like Ruth mentioned earlier on. So a lot more manageable international arbitration when it comes to that speed and finality. I'm going to ask Marcus now, can you get sure. our injunctive relief? Okay, our we're in our... Yeah, we're in our home stretch. And by the way, I've seen a number of questions that kind of uh, go into this issue. So I uh, want to hit on this really uh, head on. And let's just take as our example uh, an IP licensing agreement. You know, there, I've also seen questions uh, in the thread here about patent related issues. Remember, if you're in arbitration, it's, it's not your typical uh, patent infringement action. That's in tort, right? So it's got, there has to be an underlying contract. Frequently though, patent issues will arise in an IP licensing agreement, right? Because if, if I'm not actually practicing your patent, I don't have to pay uh, under the license, among other theories. 
right? So if you have an IP licensing dispute, also trade secrets, by the way, can fall into this bucket. We know that the courthouse is always open. You can run in there, you can get a TRO uh, at the very same time that you file your complaint. There's no delay and that gives IP owners a certain amount of comfort that they feel that they lack in arbitration. Next slide, please. Now, what happens uh, in the arbitration setting? Well, as we know, looking up at that top line, before your, con your tribunal is constituted, there is a period of delay, that little orange segment there. And sometimes that period can be substantial. And so what do you do when you, you need that TRO? There's a real need for speed. Well, on the, let's just go back. Hold on, I'm, we'll Sorry, just skip the verbiage. Back. I wanna talk about the picture. So essentially you have several options, okay? One, you can actually go in under most institutional rules. You can go into an emergency arbitrator. An emergency arbitrator will be up and running much more quickly than the tribunal and can usually issue uh, an emergency award that will be enforceable, just like a, a final award, uh, within a week or so. But that's still not as fast as you could get in court, at least in principle right? So you have a second option. Generally, you can also go to court for uh, your TRO or other kinds of interim measures of protection. Uh, both the background law, both the FAA, the California Arbitration Act, and most institutional rules make clear that an agreement to arbitrate does not prevent you from seeking uh, interim measures of protection from a court. And sometimes that is the appropriate thing to do. Now, the, there was a question that was asked, should I always carve out uh, injunctive relief claims from uh, an arbitration clause? And I don't think that is necessarily uh, a good idea when you have uh, these two parallel options. Uh, you may want those at the same time, but that's a, it, this whole issue is a pretty deep one and will be discussed in much more detail uh, during some substantive panels during International Arbitration Week. So with that, what I would suggest is let's fast forward uh, through these uh, remaining slides and get to the part where Jeff is going to introduce us to the great lineup for our and just arbitration week. Everyone, yeah. Um, Jeff, is it really true that California Arbitration Week is going to be free? There's no such thing as a free lunch, is there? From you, Jeff. Jeff, you went new. mute. Thank you, sorry. Um, so in this case, yes, it's complimentary, <laughs> AKA free. Uh, thanks to our many sponsors, by the way. And if you go to the website, which is someone could put in uh, for everyone to see the registration on the website, uh, lists all of our sponsors. And I particularly want to recognize King and Spalding and Jams as our platinum sponsors. And because of that, you can actually get incredible content with 28.25 hours of MCLE from some of the best speakers in the world. We have 87 of them, I believe is the number, plus additional programming on Thursday. So real quick, just to walk you through this. And, and before that, it, I do that, I wanna just make quick note. If you notice on every slide, there's two names, California Lawyers Association, which you heard about, and it's the ADR committee. And then also California Arbitration, which is a relatively new California, but really international organization focusing on promoting international arbitration in California. And if you go to calarb.org, calarb calarb.org, you can find out more information about California Arbitration, which is also involved in California International Arbitration Week, which I'm gonna talk about, and you can also become a member. So real quick, because uh, we're short on time, uh, the programs you see, for example, like the three first programs on Monday are put on by the American Arbitration Association, ICDR, their international arm, credible programs. The next one, Surfing the Rising Waves of Arbitration, is from the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association. These programs have California practitioners with the foreign speakers. So it is California-centric, ultimately. And the next program that you see is put on by the Korea Commercial Arbitration 
uh, Board International. So just the first day global. And then what's not on the chart, which should be appealing to everybody who's listening in today, we have two networking mixers on Monday at the end of the day at a Asia friendly hour, we have a networking mixer. And then going to the next day, Monday, Tuesday morning, we have another mixer, which is European friendly time. And these are gonna have breakout rooms and a wonderful opportunity to network uh, at whatever level you may be in familiarity with international arbitration. We're gonna have a global audience uh, for this uh, international arbitration week in our programs. And if you go to the next day, Tuesday, um, just to give you a quick little flavor, uh, the Women Arbitration Program is put on by the great arbitral women. Uh, you have the necessary uh, Wednesday here, sorry. On Tuesday, <laughs> we have uh, uh, the networking. We have the California uh, CLA, California Arbitration, which I mentioned just a moment ago, joint programs. We have a great program from the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, another one from the Singapore International Arbitration Center, which is the last one on the slide for you. And if we go to the next slide on Wednesday, uh, you have the program by the Arbitral Women. We have lots of really great programs on all dimensions of international arbitration and dispute resolution from diversity to latest trends. This is the number of amazing speakers is incredible to have in one week, let alone for free. Uh, I will also mention that the Necessary Symbiosis program on Wednesday, which we don't need to go back on, is from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators North American branch. Uh, we have a program on Wednesday from the International Chamber of Commerce. And if we go to Thursday, uh, that's a day where a little of a break because it's being put on by the uh, USC JAMS as a symposium, but it will start off with, and if you register, you'll get access to all of these programs. But if you register, you'll have, we'll be able to get you access to how to hear I understand Gary Bourne, who's a uh, world famous international arbitration as the keynote speaker, and that will be a hybrid. So there'll be an in-person component of things. Uh, so register and you'll get that information. And then if we go to the last day on Friday, uh, you have that program put on first, the Islamic finance and banking by the Asian International Arbitration Center. Uh, you have a great program on diversity by JAMS. And the point of this is you register one time, you'll get access to all these programs. I will also share that if you miss programs, which is gonna be likely because it's a full week from morning to end of the day, they're all recorded. They'll all be available for demand probably for about 30 days. So if you register, you'll have access to everything. Don't miss this opportunity. It's a wonderful you know, experience for the price to get MCLE, hear from some of the most talented speakers in the world and learn a lot more about the importance of international arbitration in California and why we're trying to make California more of a place for international disputes to be heard, which is ultimately a pro business for California issue because if people have more arbitrations here versus going to New York, Miami or other parts of the world like Hong Kong or Paris or London, it generates more work for lawyers, more work for the staff of you know, court reporters, more work for arbitrators, more work for whole, and money for hotels, restaurants. It just creates a whole industry that we want to have more of. And also, if you have clients who are here, why should they have to go to other parts of the world for their international arbitration? Stay in California and have the dispute heard here, even if it's administered by some international organization. So well, please register. Uh, it takes just a second and you'll have access to everything. Yes, I think you were going to put the registration in the chat. I'm sorry, we're over time. We haven't had a chance to, to respond to all the questions in the chat, but I think all the members of the panel would welcome your questions individually. We can put our email addresses in chat. Uh, I want to thank my panel so much. Uh, you've been wonderful and uh, really enjoyed putting the program on together with you and see you in a couple of weeks, California International Arbitration Week. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Uh, we'll put our, our emails uh, addresses in, in chat. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye, everyone.